Boy outfit on today for reasons. All right. Good morning, everybody. I guess we're getting ready to start. I've been asked to go ahead and get up here. Please take a seat. If you come in here and thought you arrived at the rodeo, well, yes, you have. <laughs> I got my Western clothes off for a purpose. But the first thing we always do in this path is what? We come before the Lord with a prayer and our petitions for our class. So I've asked Jerry Perez to come up here and open us in prayer. Jerry, please come up. <laughs> Hey everybody, how's it going? Um, first of all, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. It's a beautiful day. Amen. And thank you, Jesus. We had been getting a lot of rain, but praise God that it was just a kind of like not really hard rain, but just rain. Anyway, Father God, we come before in the name of Jesus. We love you. We worship you. We thank you for who you are. We just ask, Father, that the word be brought out today and that it brings glory to you. But let it resonate in our spirits. Let us know without a doubt in our mind that you are right here with us. Where you say when two or three on anything concerning things of this earth, you who are in heaven will do it. Because you say when two or three are gathered in your name, you are right here with us. I thank you, Father, that we are of one mind. And I thank you that we have the mind of Christ. And we do it all to glorify you. And we do this in the name of the Lord Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Well, um, I dressed like this on purpose this morning because this coming Tuesday night, we'll be back in our book at 7 o'clock here. We had a great turnout last Tuesday. Good pizza, good fellowship. I think we had, what, 20, 8, 29 people here, 59 people on Facebook and one of them. So we had a good turnout. This Tuesday night, we're going to have spaghetti dinner, and we're in chapter two of this book here, Christians and Christians. I want you to look at this. This comes out of the book, okay? Juan, come up here. Juan is a lawyer, <laughs> and I want you to look at this statement. It comes out of our book, and it says here, what's wrong with this world, and what's the answer? I am. Uh, like, Jesus comes along and tells Moses, God told him, brother, what he say? I am. Would you explain that, please? Well, it's basically accountability. Sometimes what's really wrong with the world is, is us. Mm -hmm. it, it's a very um, hard truth to uh, swallow. Yeah. But sometimes we are the problem. And, and, uh, and, and, and that's a start, because then you start with fixing the problem. Mm -hmm. I think that's why all of us are here. That's thank you, Juan. Hey, okay, Kurt. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see you here. Glad to be here. Um, so we're 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 we've been going. This is our 10th lesson in the book of Genesis, and we're now finally past all the, the stuff that's not true, like creation by God and a global flood and all these things that happened. Now, I say that tongue in cheek. No matter what uh, the world may say, God gives us in those first 10, first, um, 10 chapters um, of the this is like, to me, I was just thinking this week, you know, the, the name of the book, Genesis Beginnings, he, he explains everything. And so what we've looked at so far were really a lot of different instances of man's rebellion against God. Even in, in the garden after he created all of the world, all the plants, all the animals, created Adam, then created Eve. Um, in the garden, Adam and Eve chose to disobey God by eating the, the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the only tree in the garden that he said not to eat. Then we saw uh, a different kind of sin. That was the first sin. That was a sin that impacted all of us because the Bible says through Adam's sin, death reigned and it, and it came upon all men. And so it's only in Christ that we're able to be able to, to, to break that, that sin that's in our lives. So we're born with sin, but, you know, we do a pretty good job of choosing the sin as well, right? Yes. And so that's kind of a universal thing. But when, then we go on and we see Cain and Abel. 
and we see Cain murder his brother, right? And then and then we see the wickedness of the of mankind go on, very right? much like we're talking a moment ago, until God brought the flood and he saved Noah, a righteous man and his family. And then even after the, the flood, as civilization grew, as, as mankind grew, and 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 then we, we get we see more and more of the evil and things turning. And last week we talked about the you know the Tower of Babel, which was the ultimate of of man saying, I, I'm gonna make something of me. I don't need God. It's about me. Look what we can do, you know, if we build this this great tower. And of course, the Lord came in and confused the languages, and the people went in different directions. They, the, we didn't study it, but Genesis chapter ten, it, it may look like just a bunch of endless genealogies, and there are several in the Bible, and you can get really caught up in so and so begat so and so. That's why I read the NIV. You know, you can say you know you don't have all the begats, but um, it it really lays out the different people groups and where they went and where they migrated. And so today we're, we're, we're switching gears because everything that happened prior to chapter 12 was man trying to do it his way. And so now in chapter 12, we come to the time when, when God calls Abram and, and begins the process of, of reconciling man to God. And I don't mean began it because he said even in the garden, remember when with Eve and, and the serpent, he told the serpent her seed will crush your seed, right? So there was a, a, a prophecy even in the very beginning, even when the first sin happened, God said that he had a plan, but now we're going to begin to see how it works out in human lives. And it happens with the call of Abram. Now, to understand chapter 12, let's look a little bit at the end of chapter 11, because it kind of gives us some context. Uh, look in the second half of verse 22, uh, or verse 22. This is the account of Terah. <coughs> Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. And while his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Micaiah, uh, or Micah, Milka. I'm, I'm using somebody else's glasses. I don't usually, I don't usually mess up more than twice. But with somebody else's glasses, it's three times. <laughs> so um, she was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milka and Iska. Now Sarai was barren, and she had no children. So th verse 31 says, Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, um, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur, of the, of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there, and Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. Now look at verse 12, because now we're going to see the covenant that God makes with Abraham. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go into the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. And I will bless you and I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Now we're going to look at this because this this applies to them. This applies to us. Yes. And it's, it's, it's very exhaustive in what the Lord said there. But I want you to notice uh, uh, just a couple of things getting into this. One is back in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, people would mock this passage and say, you know, the, I'm talking about educated people, people that had gone to universities. Europe had a very strong university system 
all during the, those centuries that I told you. Um, I had a professor at Dallas Baptist University that ended up teaching at Baylor at, at later. His name was Dr. Parker. And he went to the University of Basel in Switzerland. And he went into one of those courses before he did his coursework where they start writing on the board and there's no English at all. Everything was, in, in this case, was in German. And so immediately, you, you, I mean, it's sink or swim. You just get totally immersed in it. And, and you know, he tells the story. One time he went in to a bakery and he asked for some sliced bread. And the girl went and she went and, and then the, the manager was walking up and and he said and he said it again and, and she kind of got embarrassed and started laughing and they, they finally got him to understand that instead of asking for sliced bread, he asked for circumcised bread. <laughs> and so you see that you see the whole nature of, of the language and stuff. But but he one of the things that he told me, and he I, you know, he's I don't he hasn't passed yet, but he's he's very he's in his 80s now. But all through that time. Theology was called the queen of the sciences. So the, theology was even higher than any of the, the physical sciences. It was higher than philosophy. It was, it was the apex of education. But one of the things that happened during this time is a lot of the unbelievers would say, oh, that, that, that's just another one of the stories, like the first nine, ten chapters before it, eleven chapters before it. You know, it didn't really didn't really happen. It's just myth. But in the 1930s, they found the ruins. They know the dimensions, how many meters this way by how many meters this way. They found the ruins of the ancient city Ur of the Chaldeans. And so what I find interesting, too, is I have a friend who was my roommate in college, and um, he's been a missionary for the last five years in Taiwan, but everything prior to that, to, since we graduated, four years after we graduated, because we both did master's work, um, he was a missionary in China. And when he went for his language studies, he met a Taiwanese girl and he married her. And so they have a family and his son, his daughter lives in Duncanville and his son lives in Dallas and goes to Dallas Baptist University. But he, he used to tell me, and any time the opportunity come up, he would tell anybody. He says, "God leads you when you're moving." And he was telling me that when I was looking for a job. How many of you guys like looking for a job? I mean, that is the worst job in the world, isn't it? Looking for a job. And so the typical thing is you you send resumes and then you sit. Well, I sent out a bunch of resumes and you're just like waiting. You should be working right, to send out some more. Well, I had an interview. I'm waiting on that interview. Keep texting. Did I get the job? Did I get the job? But when you should be moving. And so I was like doing all of that stuff, you know, that and watching, watching TV and whatever. And he goes, you know, the Lord will speak to you and he'll give you direction and he'll open a door. He works with you as you're moving. And so they were already on the way you know, they 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 stopped in 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 Heron and Tara was old, so old that that's where he ended up dying. And that might have been why they stopped. It was probably hard for him to travel um, and, you know, at that age and everything. And we're talking a, a good distance, hundreds and hundreds of miles. And so they get there. And then in Chapter 12, God calls out Abram and his name I called him Abraham a minute ago in chapter 17 God changes his name from Abram to Abraham Abram means like uh, exalted father Abraham means the father of many the father of nations and and to this day Abraham is is considered the father of of Judaism Christianity and even the Muslims could claim him as the father of their religion. So he's a significant person in the Bible. And so, but God called him and, and he said, leave your country, your people and your father's household and go to the land that I will show you. That was significant. 
he was leaving a city when they left Ur. Ur was a was a, a a cultured city. You know, they had they had you know government. They had you know different things for people to do. Where he was, where God ends up taking him to Canaan, is considered really not just rural but uncivilized. And I want you to I want you to catch the significance of the call that God put on Abraham's life because or Abram's life at this point, because it's it's so unlike anything we've ever done. You know, I, I, I got a new car and I went to, to Austin to get it and I was planning out everything. You know, I had to turn in the rental. So I got me an Uber and I had made sure I had my backpack packed with water sitting on that bus. I rode that mega bus to Austin, got my mom and dad to pick me up. And, you know, even a little bitty short trip like that, I had everything planned and I was trying to do everything I could to make sure nothing went wrong. And yet here God comes to Abram and he says, I want you to leave. And I want you to leave everything that you've known. And I want you to go to a place. And even tell him where, where I tell you to go. And, and if you look at his father, his father, Tara, his, his name meant moon. And one of the things that we found out about the city of Ur, it was a, 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 a center of idolatrous worship. And Terah's name means moon. And that was one of the places where they had a very elaborate, you know, worship of, of the lunar system, the cycles of the moon and the gods associated with that. And so he's calling a man who has no faith in him, the Lord, and he calls him to this place. And so it's interesting because there was the in chapter four of Romans, Paul uses Abraham as the example of what faith is. And so you see that first bit of faith is that he put his faith and trust in God, the one who created us, the one who who made us and and the one to whom we give an account. And so he gave his his faith to him there. And, and he also had this promise. He says, I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great and you'll be a blessing. And I'll bless those who bless you and whoever curses you. I, I'll, I will curse and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So basically the, the, that promise, which is also a prophecy because we see it all being fulfilled throughout the scriptures in, in Abraham's life and then in his descendants and then even now today in our lives, it consisted of three things. Um, it was it was the legacy. Well first it was it was it was the land, the legacy, and then the Lord. And and we'll look at that as as we go through. So it says Abraham took verse four Abraham left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham, Abram at this time, was 75 years old when he set out of Haran, and he took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the positions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. So the first thing that you see about faith is what God calls you, and, and he, he calls us initially to come to him in relationship. He calls us to come to him and be saved by trusting in his son, Jesus Christ, who, who died on the cross to, to take away our sins. He bore my sin. He bore your sin. And by his shed blood, the scriptures tell us that, that we're forgiven of our sin. And, and, and we, we enter into that relationship by faith. Compare that to chapter 11 last week when they were trying to do everything by self. They're trying to create their own their own name, right? Their own worth, their own righteousness, their own desires, their own agenda. Everything was self, self, self. And, and, and then put that with just our lives day to day. When we have problems in relationships, we have difficulties with people at work, that word self is somewhere in the mix, is it not? Somebody's got their own agenda. Somebody's got their feelings hurt. Somebody, it's, it's me, it's mine, it's self. 
And so the first thing about faith is that it requires an obedience to that call. Did you notice that it says in, in, in the English, it says, so Abraham left. Well, that word left, when, when it's translated in, in the Hebrew, it's like, get yourself out. You go out. So the emphasis is not just on, on, on the leading part, the left part. The emphasis is on the you part. You are the one that I'm calling. You are the one that I'm telling to leave. And, and immediately he obeyed. And so we see that faith in, in the Lord is always trusting and obeying. And I want you to see and to realize and, and to try to imagine what that must have been like for him. If you look in, in Hebrews, in Hebrews, it, 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 it tells us, again, just a, a different way to, to, to put it in. It says, by faith... Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with the foundations whose architect and builder was God. So some, the, 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 the New Testament is interpreting what happened in Abraham's life. And I think it's interesting that even Abraham, as God called him and, 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 and he obeyed and he's moving and he gets to the land of Canaan. And can you imagine what it's like when he finally gets there? He looks around and he sees the Amorites and he sees the Hittites and he sees all these other people that are already living there, and yet he knows because what's going through his mind is God said, I get, I'm giving you everything that you can see. And then a little bit later in the story, we don't, we're not going to read it today, but a little bit later, they've got so many possessions and the Lord had blessed them because there's always blessing that comes with obeying the Lord. Do you hear me? A lot of times it's 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 easier or our, our, our desire is just to to not really okay, I, I know you're there, Lord, but I I want to do what I want to do. And it's easier to do what you want to do, it's easier to disobey him, but you'll never realize and understand and experience what it's like to have a relationship God with God and, and to feel the blessings that he gives you. And I don't mean just material blessings or, or I'm talking spiritual blessings, emotional blessings, relational blessings, uh, financial too. You know, I mean, I mean, God's opened doors for me in my life that I knew were that that was not anything that I could do on my own. But it's the relationship with Him. Yeah. But it happens when we obey. Well, they get there and they're they're moving. They the couple of things that that happened is it sounds like. Abraham is just, man, this guy is Johnny on the spot with the Lord. But he had his fears too. And so when he gets there, there's a famine. And instead of trusting the Lord in the famine, because uh, the Lord can provide anywhere, amen? amen. We've, we've seen Jesus in the times when he fed the, the, the 5,000 and, and, and then he fed, he fed the, the, the 10,000 and then he fed the 5,000. And you add in the, the the women and the children, and I mean, and we've got the story of of, of Elijah and, and the woman that only had a little bit of oil, and she was going to make her last meal for her and her son there in the book of Kings. And and what happens is he says, make me a meal too. And then he tells her to go out and get the oil from all of her neighbors. And when the last cup that she had, and she borrowed that, she just and, and God provided through that whole famine. So they go to Egypt and then they get into trouble there in Egypt because he was fearful. He he had faith, but at the same time, he was fearful. He goes down there and he goes, well, you know, and I, everything I can tell in the Bible, um, Sarah, Sarai, her name changes to Sarah. She was a looker. She was really a beautiful woman. And he was so insecure in himself and insecure even in the promise that God gave him 
that he tells her, you tell everybody you're my sister. That way they don't kill me, you know, and, and I'll be able to, to keep going. And one of the kings took her into his harem. And God immediately, don't think anything happened because God immediately began to bring all kinds of, of disease and everything else in that household. And he finally brought Abraham back to him. He said, why did you tell me this was your wife, you know? And, and he said, take her and go. And, and they went and then they're going back up to, to Canaan to the place where he had set up an altar and worshiped the Lord. And as they're going there, I guess the cattle kind of got intermixed and, you know, hey, his bull cut me off, you know, and the herdsmen started fighting. And, and, and so Abraham went to Lot, who was his nephew, and he said, look, let's not have quarrels amongst us. We're brothers. You know, pick where you want to go. And Lot looked over to the east and he saw the plains, which before God's judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah had a lot of lush vegeta vegetation. And was where the twin cities were, Sodom and Gomorrah. He, he went there. Uh, Abraham went more into, into Canaan proper. And so I, my, my, my point is, is when you come to know the Lord, it doesn't mean everything just runs super smooth. A lot of times the Lord uses difficulties in our life amen, amen. to teach us about trusting him, yes. to teach us how to get into that place of obeying him to trust and obey. And, and then when you do, he blesses and you, and you're amazed by the door that he opens or the situation that changes or the hearts of other people that change and whatever the situation is, but he uses those things. In fact, I, I just want to, I want to bring this verse up in the, in the book of first Peter, It says, it says, he's talking, I'll just back up, go to verse three. It says, praise be to God and to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, it's the resurrection of Christ that trips people up. It's the resurrection of Christ that proves he is, in fact, God, as he said he was. It proves that 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 when he died on the cross to take away our sins, that that, in fact, satisfied the requirements of righteousness for God. And, and to prove it, God raised him from the dead. And so we, we're blessed by this. And he says we're, we, we now have an inheritance that can never perish. Look at that in verse 4. It, cannot, it can never perish spoil or fade it's kept in heaven for you and through faith we are shielded by god's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time uh when when the lord comes back all of this will be made clear to everybody but the inheritance that the Lord's given us, the forgiveness that he's given us, the relationship that he's provided for us by taking away our sin. If we'll simply look to him in faith and say, Lord, I, I know that you are, in fact, God, and I know that you died on the cross to take away my sins. I, I commit myself to you and I repent of my sin. This last week in one of the chats that I'm on, uh, Kirby was sending some stuff about, you know, people coming to know the Lord and some of the witnessing and stuff that they were doing. But one of the things that he mentioned that I caught, and he said, it's nothing that repentance won't change. Mm -hmm. And that is so true because our, our hearts are bent towards doing what we want to do. But when, and this is really what it means to become a Christian. This is really what it means to have a relationship with God the Father is, is to say, Lord, I give myself to you and I turn from my sin. I can't do anything about my sin, but I'm so thankful that you gave your son to die in my place and to take away my sin. The punishment that Christ had was due me, but Christ took that on himself and now has forgiven me by his shed blood. So my, my responsibility is to turn from my sin and to seek to follow the Lord. 
And so you've got all of the land that he gave him. And people have been fighting on that over that land ever since that time. You know, it's just, it's just like it's never ending. But we have it going on right now, whether it's the the Arabs and you can go down through history, the Byzantine, there are different people that went and 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 fought for that land during the Crusades. Everybody was fighting for that land, but that land fought for that land. Get the right verb tense. Fought for the land, but all that time that land was promised to Abraham and to his descendants, which Abraham's 12 sons became what? The 12 tribes of Israel. So that is that is Israel's land. And and even through history, we can go back and and ancient secular historians speak of it like in David's time to talk about the land of, of Israel under the King David. It was always Israel's land. And then now we come to even present day when it makes no difference if it's if it's Arab nations or other nations or or, or terrorist groups, the stuff that we see with Hamas happening over there is, is another example of them trying to take the land away from Israel. In 1948, Israel became a nation again. What a profound fulfillment of prophecy and a, and a time date stamp to say we are approaching the time that Christ is going to come back. Because he says that he will gather his people. The, the lost tribes will come. And, and, and so they're a nation again. So we see the land. And then we, we, see, the, we see the legacy. Because like I said a minute ago, he had, he had Isaac. And what's interesting about the scriptures is there's so many things that the Holy Spirit will direct you to and point you to if you'll just start reading the Bible. Yes. When, when Abraham was peddling off Sarah as his sister, Isaac must have watched his dad do it because we find Isaac does the very same thing. <laughs> so it's the, for us as fathers and, and grandfathers and as parents, it's important that we walk with the Lord and we let the Lord lead us because otherwise the, the sin in our life, the, the rebellion in our life just gets passed on to the kids and all of a sudden, you're seeing the very same thing that that you're doing. You're seeing it in, in your child. And God promises to break that curse and to break that cycle. But it starts with us when we're willing to submit ourselves to the Lord and, and to turn from our sin and to receive him as our Savior. And so you've got you've got the land you've got the legacy so the 12 tribes and it's interesting because you look back in in chapter 10 it gives you the table of nations i was telling you about and you may think man this is kind of weird reading through all these names but it's through shem that goes and then it's then it's abraham and then through abraham it it goes through and 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 then we get down to the point that it's it's david and then from david we get all the way down to the point where christ is in that whole lineage and you can trace it all through the scripture how god has kept his word and laid out how it was going to be and so we've got the legacy there the seed of abraham um we read in galatians that anyone who comes to christ is now included in the seed of abraham so all of us here yes. as believers if you're a believer here today you're you're you or proof of God's word and his promise and his truth that he is working salvation and he's working it through that lineage and the promise that he gave Abraham or Abram until he's called Abraham. Can't you imagine what it was like for him and Sarah? He's 75, she's 65. That's probably, they lived longer then. So it was probably like he was in his, in his 50s. She might've been in her 40s. You know, and they still they didn't have any kids, and then every time every year passed by, they still didn't have any kids. He goes, Oh, Abram, Abram, that means father. You have any kids? No. I got a dog though. You know, and I mean he's a dog parent. But but he still trusted the Lord, even when he got fearful. And and next week we're gonna talk about even another fearful thing where he got impatient and he took things into his own hands. And and, and it's a great study. Um, but 
so we, we've talked about the land, we've talked about the lineage, and now we talk about the Lord. Because it is through these promises and this covenant that he made with Abraham that we come to the place where Christ came. And just like Abraham left the place where he was and left everything behind to go to a place that he didn't know, the Lord left every place that he was in glory and entered into human existence and took on a, a frail human body like you and I have. And he, he humbled himself, it says in Philippians, and he humbled himself to the point of death. And therefore, in his obedience, God raised him up and, and he is our savior. Yeah. And so as the, as the Lord, it's through these promises that all people have a path to be able to have relationship with God. And that is to meet his son, the Lord Jesus, and to receive him and to, to and, 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 and from that point on, it's a, it's a, it's a daily prayer and attitude of heart where you say, Lord, I give myself to you. I want to yield myself to you. I want you to lead me and I want to obey you. And as he points out things in your life, you say, okay, and you go this way or you go that way, or there may be something in your life that he says, I don't want that in your life. And it's a, it's an issue of turning from it. It's an issue of, of, of giving yourself to him. But all of that happens as people come to know him as the Lord. And the same thing that has happening with the land has always happened with the Lord. People reject the truth of God. The, Paul says in Romans, you know, you can look at creation and you can see that there is a, a God and you can see that he has personality. And yet people, men, unbelieving men, unbelieving women, they suppress that truth because they reject it. They don't want to they don't want to yield to it. They don't want to humble themselves. And yet it's it's the reality. And uh, the, the fighting that goes on so much is also trying to get rid of of Christ, trying to get rid of, of religion, trying to get rid of God. But as believers, like Abraham, when God calls us, when he leads us, we need to obey and we need to trust him. And then at the same time, as this promise is for everyone, we need to be about sharing and helping people to know how to have a relationship with Christ. Families can get changed. Marriages can get changed. The Lord is sovereign in our lives. And when we yield to him, we begin to see the blessings that he has for us. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we come to you today with thanksgiving in our hearts for what you've done for us. I thank you, Lord, that you've, you've forgiven me and that you've called me and that you've accepted me. And, and, and you've done that not of anything that I've done or I've deserved. You've done it by your grace. And I just ask you to, to help me to, to walk in obedience with you and to trust you as, you as you guide me in my life. And Lord, I pray for everyone here in this room that, that you would speak to each and every one of our hearts, Lord, and make yourself known and 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 show us what it is that you want us to do in our lives. For those of you who don't know Christ, hear his call right now. Yes. Because he's calling you just as he did to Abraham. Amen. To turn from yourself, to turn from your sin, and to, to trust him and to obey him and to follow him. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for our class. I thank you for our church. We ask you to bless now the services. Keep, keep us close to you this week. Bring us back next week, we pray in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Can you pass these around to everyone? Thank you, Curtis. Wonderful lesson of Abraham. Yeah. Abraham, Sarah, she didn't have a baby until she was almost 100. Yeah, right. Crazy. So uh, right now you're getting passed around. Uh, you know, our punch cards, Gerald was always asking us to punch our punch cards. Punch cards, and this week's punch is service. All right, so to go along with the week of service, um, we have the loving kids. 
or is asking for uh, donations that you can put in donation bins throughout the atrium. What is Loving Kids? This is a, 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 a foundation that works with the uh, four schools around town. They, uh, they supply meals and clothing for kids who would otherwise not have it. They want to make an environment to where the children can actually learn. And it's hard to learn if you don't have clothes or food. They actually serve, I actually, uh, earlier I, I, I found out, that they serve dinner, breakfast, lunch, and dinner to these children. The people wait there until seven o'clock at night so that they can make sure that these children have three meals. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. And we're just asking for some, if, if you have uh, some some food or clothes that you can donate, put it in the bins. That will help them out. Uh, the new calendar is out. It's in the back. We also have breakfast sign up. You like the uh, wonderful food that we have here. We're looking for some people to help out. Bring your stuff. This will be in the back as well. James Bell is having a Super Bowl party. And guess what? Next week, you can wear your jersey, probably football, but whatever jersey you have, because, you know, there's a big game next Sunday. So um, wear your, your sports jersey to church. And also uh, James Bell, I believe he said around 4 o'clock. Is there a, some an e bite or something going out for that? Huh? Okay, there it's already been sent. Already been sent. So look for that if you're planning on going. Also, I heard to tell you about that. I haven't told you about service. Much today is that Cafe Express. Is there anything else? Oh, what am I missing? Tuesday again, the interesting Christianity for people who are not Christian. Where is that at? Right here. That's spaghetti right dinner for everybody. And you get a spaghetti dinner. What's what's French bread? Garlic bread. <laughs> anything else? Am I missing anything? Let's close. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this beautiful, beautiful weekend. Watch over and protect us as we go throughout the week and help us all to come back again next week. Thank you for your blessings. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.